My name is Christina McClellan, and I'm a woman at I'm the Chief Curator at the University Hi, of I'm Iowa Marin, Museum of Art, and I'm a woman at Iowa. She's Gigi Durham. I'm an associate professor in the School of Journalism, and I'm a woman at Iowa. Welcome to the second season of Women in Iowa, a show that explores the work, experience, and lives of women on the University of Iowa campus. I'm your host, Anna Bostwick Fleming, and our guest today is Lori Haig. She's the program director at the Women's Resource and Action Center. She's also the 2004 winner of the Jean Y. Ju Women's Rights Award. Lori, thank you so much for being here with us sure, today. I'm glad to be here. Well, I know that you grew up in a rural community in central Illinois, mm -hmm. that you got a BA and an MA at Illinois State University. Yes. How did you come to Iowa? I actually came here to a, a PhD program in communication mm. studies. Iowa has a really excellent uh, communication mm -hmm. program, one of the best in the nation, and I came here after I got my master's. Mm. Um, it was as a graduate student that you first became involved in the Women's Resource and Action Center, or RAC. What were they doing over there that uh, <laughs> attracted you? That's a good question. They were doing a lot of things in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually became interested in, in RAC. I was seeing uh, ads for it, in the, mm -hmm. actually in the personal, the classifieds in the newspaper when I would sit around the student union or the, the lounge at uh, CSB looking at the paper and they were always asking for volunteers and they had all this interesting slate of uh, support and discussion groups that would be listed frequently and just I, you know people I knew had had some connection to it mm -hmm. and so by my second semester I felt like I had settled into the program enough and uh, wanted a little more attachment to the community than I was mm -hmm. getting in my program. So I, I sought it out as a volunteer opportunity the mm -hmm. second semester I was here. Mm -hmm. And this wasn't by any means your first venture into community activism, right? I think you were a part of an underground newspaper in <laughs> Illinois? Yeah. Yes, I was. In the 1980s, I was part of a, a yeah, an underground newspaper. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we say community newspaper, community but newspaper. truly it was, a, it was an underground newspaper uh, that was a monthly publication mm -hmm. in uh, Bloomington, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And it was a a free, uh, everybody was a volunteer, uh, and it touched on a lot of topics uh, that were, you know, grassroots kinds of topics from mm -hmm. unions to uh, anti-racism to exposing uh, police corruption and corruption wow. at the university mm -hmm. and other things that were just, you know, more fun. I also wrote a, a review column about bars. So it, was, <laughs> it wasn't all serious uh -huh. political work by any means. Mm -hmm. And you were involved with that for quite a while, right? Yeah, uh, pretty much uh, seven or eight years, probably. Wow. Mm -hmm. It was a really great experience. I, I learned a lot of skills. I, I had an interest in, I was an art major as an undergraduate. Oh. So my initial uh, experiences with the, with the paper were like designing covers and doing mm -hmm. art for stories. And then I started writing my own stories and being a part of the sort of whole production of, mm -hmm. of the paper. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, what are some of the most exciting things that you've done as, as a part of RAC? That's a, that's a, a very big question. And since <laughs> I've been there for so long now, I, I uh, you know, starting as a volunteer and then becoming a, a staff member mm -hmm. uh, in the early 90s, I mean, there have been a lot of things. As a volunteer, when I first started, RAC was very involved in, uh, in a, with an organization called Women Against Racism. Mm -hmm. And Women Against Racism was doing a major, major uh, conference when I first started volunteering, they were gearing up for it. And I was able as a volunteer to, to take part in some of the preparatory steps for that conference mm -hmm. and then attend the conference. And, you know, that was all new to me. It was a, mm -hmm. it was a very major undertaking, lots of people involved, lots of support from all over the country. And actually one of the, one of my volunteer jobs was I would, I would come in on whatever day it was I volunteered, Tuesday afternoons or something, and Sue Buckley, who was the director then, would mm -hmm. hand me this pile of checks. And I had to stamp Rack's account number on the back and, and fill out a deposit slip for them. And they were checks from, you know, just a couple dollars to hundreds of dollars that people mm -hmm. were sending in from all over the country to, not to pay to come, but mm -hmm. to pay for other people or to, just to make this thing happen. They were donations. and. Uh, so it was clear that this was a, a huge grassroots effort to make it happen. And, you know, there were grants and that kind of thing that supported it as well. But it was really, you know, just folks like us mm -hmm. that were, were sent, saying, here's $5 for this thing because it sounds really great. And then uh, when it finally happened, uh, hundreds and hundreds of women came from all over the country and nobody had to pay a cent if they couldn't 
pay. I mean, people who could pay did, and people who couldn't pay, their their travel was paid, their housing was paid, their fee to attend the conference was paid. So it was a very exciting, and lots of super influential uh, women were there from all walks of life, and it was it was a great experience as a certainly as a volunteer to be a part of that and see it happen. Mm -hmm. And it was hundreds of volunteers that made it happen. Oh. And um, so that really set the stage for me to to know that Rec was capable of, of huge things. And so when when I started working there, one of the first um, major events that I took on was was to create a women's music festival. Mm -hmm. Partly because I was a, a musician myself, and you know, had experiences in going to women's music festivals and performing at mm -hmm. them and attending them, and also in you know trying to be a musician in mm -hmm. the real world as well, which <laughs> is somewhat different than the women's music festival world. So, when I had an opportunity to create one, mm -hmm. I put the word out and I asked for you know people to come to an organizing meeting, see if there was enough interest, and like, thirty-five people showed up mm -hmm. one Sunday afternoon at the library, and so it was like the a big green light to go ahead and do it. And so we formed a, a community-based committee, and uh, over the course of about a year, we made it happen. And mm -hmm. it's now 16 years later, and it's still wow. going on. So what was it like that first year? I mean, what sorts of activities did you plan for it? What was it like mm -hmm. to plan this big event and that hadn't been done before here? It was really uh, exciting. There was a lot of hard work. It was a, a core group of, I don't know, maybe a dozen people who really worked to make it happen. And then a bigger group that, you know, stepped in and did different mm -hmm. parts. But, you know, a, a dozen or so people who, you know, got together every Sunday afternoon and, and talked about, you know, what are we going to call it? What's it going to look like? And a number of us had gone to these kinds of events. And there was sort of a model that already existed mm -hmm. so that you had, you know, one or two stages and you had a certain, you know, variety of music. And then, then there were workshops and so we you know we tried to I identify those main things that people would expect at this sort of thing that mm -hmm. there would be music of course that there would be some workshops and that there would be vendors mm -hmm. and child care was an important issue oh. and so we made sure that there was child care offered and that there was you know there were activities for kids to do mm -hmm. and a, a space for them to be in that mm -hmm. so their parents you know would be able to enjoy the festival and that mm -hmm. the kids could enjoy the festival in their own way and uh, so, you know, we formed committees to do those things and, you know, spent a lot of time talking it through and figuring it out and, you know, what it needed to look like and where and how are we going to pay for it and all that kind of thing. And a little bit like the Women Against Racism, you know, we put the word out, we said this is going to be a free festival, but if you can pay us money, even though we're not requiring you to do it, mm -hmm. you know, it will be much appreciated. So people mm -hmm. essentially bought tickets that they didn't need to pay for in advance, mm -hmm. to, basically to help us you know, set this thing up, and, and uh, we, we did pretty well that way, and people were extremely generous, and we got sponsors, and so we spent quite a few, you know, afternoons uh, hammering away at it, and by that September, we uh, were able to, to, you know, go and set it up, and then mm -hmm. that Friday night, we, we started off with a dance, and, you know, we didn't know if anybody would really come. I mean, we knew people had sent us money and had, you know, essentially bought tickets, but we didn't really know what mm -hmm. that meant, and you know, we set up the fairgrounds for it, and we, you know, went home to change and come back, and we came back, and there were a couple hundred people there, wow. and it was, like, it was so thrilling. I, I can't even describe. <laughs> we, we all, like, our mouths dropped open when we got to the parking lot, and it was full of cars, and there were people there, and they were already enjoying themselves, and mm -hmm. the rest of the weekend was like that. And, you know, we learned a lot that weekend, and one of the things that has sort of happened is that after a couple of years of that model, we scaled back a little. Mm -hmm. we, we actually ended up dropping the workshops because it just mm -hmm. felt like it was, it was too much for us to do mm -hmm. and uh, people weren't taking as much advantage of them as we wanted mm -hmm. for them to be considered successful. So eventually we got rid of those and we had two stages in the early days and you know our main stage and then like an open mic stage and we actually eliminated the open mic stage though we consider mm -hmm. bringing it back. Mm -hmm. uh, but we... we sort of scaled, we scaled back for a number of years because mm -hmm. we felt like that was all we could manage mm -hmm. with the volu all volunteer group. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in essence not really a volunteer because I've made it part of my job to do it, but mm -hmm. everybody else is a volunteer. So, so we scaled it back in size and, and really just focused on having a really good music experience. And in the last couple of years, we've sort of built it back up a little bit and, and, and spent more on the music and mm -hmm. spent more on the production. And, you know, maybe in a few years, it'll, it'll, it'll evolve into something else. Mm -hmm. But for right now, we're pretty happy with what it is. 
How is a women's music festival different from a music festival that that isn't specifically for women? Well, it doesn't have to be different at all, uh -huh. but the fact that most music festivals don't feature women is what makes the difference, and that's mm -hmm. why we have it and why we continue to have it, mm -hmm. is that women, you certainly 16 years ago when we first started this, and 30 some years ago when other people started, mm -hmm. you know, created this model, uh, women were not invited to these kinds of festivals. In fact, mm -hmm. the first uh, festival, women's music festival, the National Women's Music Festival that was started by my friend Kristen Lems, was started because there was a local festival in Champaign-Urbana at the University mm -hmm. of Illinois. Uh, it was the Red Herring Folk Festival, and you know had had a long tradition and happened every year. And you know, women had never played at it. Mm -hmm. And you know, Kristen went one year. She was a performer and went one year and said, "Why don't you ever have any women?" And they said, "Well, there aren't any that are good enough." And she was like, "Oh, <laughs> okay." <laughs> uh, but the the thing that I really admire about about her and about the story is that instead of picketing them or throwing a fit or you know mm -hmm. having some negative response to it, mm -hmm. she took that moment and turned it into a proactive moment and said, we are good enough and we don't need you mm -hmm. and we can do this ourselves and put out the word and other people were thinking about it too. Mm -hmm. And she put out the word and said, you know, let's do this, who's, who's with me? And she, she and her sister, uh, you know, were the foundation for it and other people from all over the Midwest started calling her and saying, you know, yes, we've been thinking about this too and, you know, came together and found the money and found the people and they did essentially what we did, but they were the first to do it mm -hmm. in 19, I want to say 74 maybe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's still going today. Wow. Well, so you're a musician yourself. Yes. Um, that's the interest. Um, I think we have a recording of you playing in the early 90s with mm -hmm. someone else who was also a part of the music festival. So let's take a listen. Okay. I'm sick and tired of fitting in. I'm tired of shoving and squeezing and sweating and swearing and looking around at those thin eyes are staring. Let me go and be as fat as I know I am. I'm sick and tired of being polite. I'm tired of smiling and chatting. A glorified form of kissing your ass and let me go. And be as loud as I know I am. Get your I'm sick and tired of playing it straight. I'm tired of husbands and boyfriends whose stories are boring. My girlfriend's right here and it's her you're ignoring. Let me go and be as queer as I know I am. Get me and deal with me as I am.
So there's definitely talented women in music. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Definitely. So that was you and and uh, Tess Catalano, mm -hmm. who was a an Iowa City uh, native. Mm -hmm. Her father was in the theater department here, and she actually uh, died about ten years ago uh, this month. And that recording was part of a compilation CD that we did of the first couple seasons of the music festival. Mm -hmm. And Tess, actually, when the music festival started that first year, she had, for the first time ever, moved away from Iowa City. Mm -hmm. So we, we made, she had been such an important figure in the community. And, you know, not only was a, a good friend of mine, but for many years before I ever came here, had been a really important figure in the community, in the feminist community, in the queer community, uh, as an activist, as a musician, uh, as, a, as a leader, uh, as early as, as high school. Um, she was quite well known around here for, for her work, and so we just really wanted to bring her back. That we, we felt like Iowa City women's music was very strongly identified with Tess. And even though she was living in uh, Tucson that first year, uh, studying to be a massage therapist, mm -hmm. we, we brought her back to perform, and then she had moved back to Iowa City by the time we made the compilation, so we, we were able to go into the studio with her and record that song. And, and you know, I'm really happy to have done that because she, she died very unexpectedly a, a few years later. And so mm -hmm. it, it's nice that we have at least a, a really mm -hmm. nice high quality recording of that song in particular was mm -hmm. quite well loved by the community, <laughs> as, it, as you can imagine, and performed at you know all kinds of rallies and events for years. So mm -hmm. even though she, uh, the, <laughs> the sort of, other side of the story is she really wanted to record something else for the <laughs> CD, and I, I didn't let her <laughs> because I just felt like that, that that song was so important to the community. So we recorded another song at the same time, and I do have that recording, but it wasn't included mm -hmm. on the CD. And that other song was? It was called Geography, and it was uh -huh. it was a more personal song about her sort of personal journey that she had entered on to, to leave Iowa City mm. and to, to move to Tucson and, and study and mm -hmm. take on this new life. So it was really about her personal journey, mm -hmm. and I, I feel a little bad, sort of retrospectively, that that's the song she really <laughs> wanted to put on there, but uh, I really felt strongly that this was the song that we, we wanted to have. Mm -hmm. So I still have the other song, and maybe mm -hmm. someday I'll, I'll find a way to put it out there. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Well, so music has been a part of your life, and even a part of your activism for mm -hmm much longer than just um, the time that you've been a part of the Women's Music Festival, even mm -hmm. down to your choice of instrument in um, elementary school. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, sure, that was a long time ago, but it was a really a kind of an influential moment, I think, in my life, because partly because I got to make a choice mm -hmm. and not have somebody tell me that I couldn't do something, and also because I, I got to see a, a role model sort of stand up for that. So. Uh, and I'm sure I'm not the only person that had this experience, but it, you know, in fifth grade, they, they do the call, and if you want to be in the band, you come in on a certain night, mm -hmm. and there's instruments there, and you try things out, and you you know commit to something. Mm -hmm. And in those days, this would have been in, still in the 60s, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, You, if you were a girl, they really geared you toward playing clarinet or flute, and that mm -hmm. was pretty much it. I mm -hmm. mean, occasionally somebody would get to play trumpet, but it was, you know, the clarinet section was all girls, and the flutes mm -hmm. were all girls, and then the rest of the band was the boy instruments, and and I wanted to play drums, and I knew that I wanted to play drums. I'd always wanted to play drums, and you know, I looked forward to this moment when I would get to join the <laughs> band and, and learn to play drums. And the band director said, "Oh, you know, you don't want to do that. You, you know, you wouldn't you rather play clarinet? You know, mm -hmm. a drum is so heavy." <laughs> <laughs> and and I was like, uh, kind of, uh, you know, I I don't know. And my mom was like, you know, she can play whatever she wants. You know, leave her alone. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you go, mom. And uh, so. You know, and had I played clarinet like my sister, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I would have given it up in a few years. I certainly, mm -hmm. it certainly wouldn't have been a lifelong choice for me, mm -hmm. I, I expect. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result of getting to to do the thing that I really, really wanted to do, I'm mm -hmm. still doing it today, mm -hmm. you know, however many, 40 years later. <laughs> and you were also involved in the movement for the Equal Rights Amendment mm -hmm. in Illinois yeah. with your music. Tell me with how that got started. Well. Illinois, in, at, toward the end of the Equal Rights Amendment campaign, which was the constitutional amendment campaign mm -hmm. to make women a part of the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. um, the failed amendment, the right? The failed yeah. amendment, <laughs> yes. Uh, by about 1980, 
the, the time was running out. There was only two more years for this mm -hmm. campaign. So things really heated up in Illinois. And mm -hmm. as an undergraduate, I was involved in a feminist group that was working on it. And uh, through uh, several doors, I guess, I, mm -hmm. I, I met the woman that I referred to earlier, Kristen Lems, mm -hmm. who started the National Women's Music Festival. I just went to hear, when, when I was uh, in college in Champaign, I went to hear her play a gig and talk to her and, you know, turned out she was recording an album and I, she said something about, you know, they were having trouble finding a drummer and I was like, oh, you know, or they had just found a drummer and I was like, oh, well, next time, you know, I play uh -huh. drums. So, you know, you could call me if you needed to. And I actually ended up doing some artwork on her first album mm. because she, she needed a logo designed. And I was like, oh, I can do that too. And so I, I designed her company logo for her when her album came out. And uh, at some point, uh, she was getting ready to record a second album. She was doing a lot of, she was an activist singer songwriter and kind of became what I like to think of it as as the troubadour of the Equal Rights mm -hmm. Amendment campaign. So her music was featured prominently at rallies and events and she traveled around quite mm -hmm. a bit uh, doing events related to the ERA and to other progressive issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was going to make a, a second album and I was playing drums on it and we were rehearsing for it and something happened and she and, and her partner who was her bass player, uh, they broke up mm -hmm. sort of suddenly and unexpectedly. And, and she, I think she mostly she didn't want to travel alone. And she said, well, you play bass, don't you? And I was like, well, yeah, I played a little bit in high school. And she was like, great, do you want to go to Notre Dame with me tomorrow <laughs> and play at this rally where they were giving Ronald Reagan a, an honorary PhD for having been the Gipper. And mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Notre Dame Central American Solidarity Group was holding a, a counter protest because that was that was a major issue at the mm -hmm. time, and so we went. I I was like, sure, why not? And um, got in the car with her, and we went and played at this rally. And actually, my pic picture ended up in the in the Chicago Tribune, <laughs> so it was my first sort of big event like that with her. And mm -hmm. you know, we ended up in in a in the Chicago Tribune, and so that was kind of like it, wow. this is <laughs> a trial by fire in a uh -huh. big way, and. Uh, then after that, I just started traveling with her. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, got to attend a lot of, of the, in those last two years of the, mm -hmm. the ERA, especially the last year where there was a lot of activity. The, mm -hmm. the ERA countdown campaign was going on, and we traveled all over the country and, and played you know, major rallies for you know, mm -hmm. twenty or 30,000 people and small you know, events of, mm -hmm. you know, for 50 people in the Capitol Rotunda, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing. So it was a really great experience. Got to see a lot of kind of the backstage, the you know, behind the doors stuff that was going on with the ERA that I mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily um, a part of, but, you mm -hmm. know, kind of got to be a, a fly on the wall while yeah. things were being discussed. <laughs> and, and so it was an interesting learning experience for me to not really be a part of the organization where this was happening so mm -hmm. much, but to see a lot of the inner workings. You were on the stage with some pretty prominent people, right? Yeah, you know, Betty Ford and, wow. you know, Phil Donahue and <laughs> <laughs> Norman Lear and a, a, a uh -huh. lot of... I think we were on the stage once with three former first ladies. Wow. Rosalind Carter was there, and Betty Ford, and uh, Lady Bird Johnson. And you're 19 years old and on the stage 19, 20, with, yeah, with, like with, with first ladies. And, yeah, and, and. It, was, it was a pretty heady experience <laughs> to get to go to Betty Ford's room for tea. Uh, <laughs> and actually, one time uh, we were flying to Los Angeles to perform at an event that was actually for Betty Ford, and I got sick on the plane. And you know, when we got to the hotel, we were like, you know, Lori's kind of sick, and is there some place I can go and lay down? And they sent me to Betty Ford's room, <laughs> and uh, there was a woman waiting there to do her hair. I could see that when I walked in, she was like really disappointed that I wasn't Betty Ford. <laughs> but Betty wasn't really going to stay in this room. But they just rented it for her to have her hair and her makeup done when she got there. And so, but I remember the look on this woman's face, like finally, you know, she's here, and it's like, oh, it's you. So, so yeah, it was it was pretty cool. Oh. At, at, the, at this particular event, uh, there was there was a lot of sort of you know, uh, television movie people there. And, and Alan Alda was one of the people who mm -hmm. was being honored at it. And and he actually uh, held Kristen's lyrics for her. She'd written a special song for mm -hmm. this event. And she's like, you know, I don't have a music stand. Could somebody hold my lyrics? And this guy <laughs> got up and it was Alan Alda. <laughs> the MASH guy, right? <laughs> the MASH yeah. guy, yes. Who <laughs> was a big feminist guy at uh -huh. the time. And this event was actually thanking him and, and Betty Ford and a couple other people for their leadership in the mm -hmm. Los Angeles area. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Kristen was... Uh, not so up on her pop culture, and she didn't realize who was holding her lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh oh, that's Alan Alda. <laughs> but it was probably good for her because she didn't weird out the, the Alan Alda was the guy standing there holding her lyrics. But it was kind of a sweet moment, really. Yeah, yeah. 
So we have a recording of you playing with Kristen Lim's, mm -hmm. um, a song that became really important towards yeah. the end of the ERA campaign. That's yeah, this song was written about a month in advance of the ratification deadline, which mm -hmm. of course passed without the ERA passing. And at that point in time, there was still a slight chance that there were four more states needed to pass it. And there was still a, a chance, so there was still a lot of energy going into mm -hmm. this thing happening. And I, I think it was about a month before mm -hmm. that there was a big rally in Illinois at the state capitol, I, you know, 30,000 people probably, mm -hmm. and Kristen had written this song, like, you know, for the event, and I hadn't heard it yet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she played it for me before we got there, and it was another thing where I, I held her lyrics for a while <laughs> before... Uh, I got to actually pick up my guitar and play. And so by the time she got to sort of the chorus, which as you'll hear sort of chants over and over mm -hmm. again, I was able to like, you know, uh, actually play along and looked up. And I hadn't looked up yet at that point. And everyone was, I could hear people singing along. And I, you know, I was young and nervous. So I, I tried not to look at what was out there. But when, by that point, you know, I, I was finally okay with it. And I looked out and, you know, 30,000 people were singing along and they all had clasped hands and they were, you know, doing this and swaying back and forth and singing along. And uh, it, was, it was a very powerful moment. Wow. And really uh, a, a real lesson about the importance of music in social movements, mm -hmm. which I think we've maybe lost mm -hmm. uh, since then. So having had all these varied experiences as an activist, how has that shaped the way you've approached your work at RAC? Hmm. I'm not always sure. <laughs> but I think, I mean, certainly having known people like Kristen and, and the women that I saw working on the ERA, I mean, there were a lot of very dedicated people who it was very, very important to them that, yeah. that this happened. And if, it, if that didn't happen, then it was very important that you know the the effort that went into it turned into something and i and i think that it did i mean mm -hmm. i i think that we see it now even though the era never passed uh things are different mm -hmm. and you know we wish that it had but uh, but kristen as a role model you know this the story i told about the her starting the music festival that that had a big impact on me it's it's so important that we not just constantly be in a position of reacting negatively to something mm -hmm. that isn't going in our favor, that we find a way to, to proactively address issues. And, and she certainly shaped my thinking on that. And, and watching people like Eleanor Smeal uh, in leadership roles, uh, you know, definitely showed me that, that, you, that you need dynamic, strong women in those roles to make things happen. And certainly we see that here at the university with people like Sue Buckley or Christine Grant, or, you know, I'm naming some of the other Jean <laughs> Jew winners, but people like that who really set an example for other people, not only who make things happen themselves, but then leave a legacy for people to follow. And so I, I think, you know, specifically with, with Kristen, I, I took her model and I, I created my own event based exactly on her model. And, and you know, all of that inspiration, I think, has, has gone into the work that I do. Mm -hmm. What are some of the changes you've seen over your time at RAC? Um, and you've been involved as a volunteer, as program director. Mm -hmm. You know, it changes all the time. Mm -hmm. Certainly in the, the early days that I was there, I think there, there was a period where RAC's role in the university was more tenuous and adversarial. And uh, I, I, I feel like we were watched kind of closely to by people who were waiting for us to make a mistake so they could get rid of us. I mean, maybe that's just me being paranoid, but uh, it, that doesn't feel like it's the case anymore. I, I feel like we've we've sort of found a place. Uh, I kind of hate to use the word mainstream <laughs> because I don't want us to be mainstream, and I I think we are, are really we are there to, to agitate sometimes, mm -hmm. but I, I feel a little safer about the things that we do. That they're not going to say, "Aha, you screwed up." <laughs> You know, you're out mm -hmm. of here. So that is definitely uh, something that, that feels different, that we're not just constantly feeling like somebody is watching over us and, mm -hmm. and reading every letter of every uh, email we send out or, <laughs> or newsletter that we might write. I mean, we definitely had that for a while, that mm -hmm. if I would put something in the newsletter that somebody didn't like, you know, the phone call would come immediately <laughs> and uh, that kind of thing. So uh, having a little more autonomy uh, mm -hmm. as, a, as a unit. And, and some of that comes from really good planning by, by people like Sue Buckley and other people who were involved in back in the early days mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, set us up as a department and, and not as, you know, uh, 
like the other cultural centers, are uh, part of a, another office and answer mm -hmm. to someone else. We, we don't do that so mm -hmm. much. We, we are a department within student services and mm -hmm. have a lot of autonomy as a result of that. Certainly, uh, the issues have changed, but they haven't at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, you know, we think we've come up with a new idea for a program, and mm -hmm. then, you know, I'll happen to be look, be looking at some uh, ancient newsletter and see that, you know, they did the same program in 1975. Mm -hmm. And it's like, oh, I guess things haven't really changed. So, you know, there's issues that we wish would go away, like sexual assault and domestic violence and uh, pay equity, inequity, and all of those things, and they're still there. So a lot of the core issues that we deal with uh, are are still there. Uh, some of the issues with, with, that students deal with have, have changed. Uh, we're, we're focusing more on leadership now. We have, this, we have this program called the New Leadership Program, which is, a, is designed to uh, encourage young women to get more involved in electoral politics mm -hmm. and in leadership positions, but specifically in thinking about running for office. And uh, we're entering our third year of doing that, and it's uh, that's new for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we always you know, encourage people, but to have a program specifically designed to give young women the skills we invite 30 of them to campus in the summer, and have, they spend a week here uh, doing workshops, uh, meeting uh, local leaders, and and living together. And and hopefully they come out and have the skills that they need to run for office, or at mm -hmm. least to give them the confidence to do it. You know, it's still only been going for this will be our third year, and so you know we don't have anybody yet who has that we know of that has gone on to run anything, mm -hmm. run for anything yet. But uh, we we think there are several that would have a lot of potential. In 2004, you won the Jean Y. Ju Women's Rights Award for your outstanding effort or achievement in improving the status of women at the University of Iowa. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about what that award means to you? Oh, it, it was huge for me. I mean, it's an annual award that, I don't know at that point, what, what year we started giving it out. And I was actually on some of the early committees that, that picked some of the early winners. And, you know, it's an annual award that recognizes an individual on campus, and, and that year I, I was the individual. Um, so it's, having been on the committee, I know that it's, there are a lot of really great women. So mm -hmm. to, to have emerged at the top of the pile, uh, you know, is, is a huge uh, compliment. Mm -hmm. And to come sort of after a lot of other amazing women who I have known, or who I didn't know, but learned about as a result of the award, which is one of the upsides of the award, is there are people doing amazing work and we don't necessarily know about it. Mm -hmm. So someone like me you know, ends up in the papers a lot, you know, being quoted or whatever, but there are other people who do amazing stuff and the town doesn't really know about them. Mm -hmm. And the award is a good opportunity for us to find out about them. Well, it's a Women at Iowa tradition to ask you to recommend a book mm -hmm. that will tell us a little bit about your perspective. Do you have yeah. anything to add to our list? <laughs> I was thinking about that. And, uh, you know, the book that just kept coming to mind, which it might be a little out of the ordinary for this particular question, but a, a book that was really important to me, uh, I actually read when I got to Iowa City, uh, is a book called, I was, you know, I was in the communication department, mm -hmm. so this is related to my studies, but it's a book called Eloquence in an Electronic Age by Kathleen Hall Jamison, who people may know from seeing her on, uh, with, interviewed by Bill Moyers mm -hmm. kind of frequently, or she shows up on CNN a lot talking mm -hmm. about political communication. And, and it's a book that talks about kind of the evolution of uh, political communication and, and public discourse from the really early Aristotelian kind of uh, <laughs> model to how it evolved. Uh, she, it came out in like 1988 uh, to what it, what political communication was then, and I think to some degree still is now, which was a, a way different model, moving from kind of fire and brimstone of the early days to, I think, what she referred to as the Donahueization of uh, political discourse that uh, Bill Clinton, you know, feel your pain kind of uh, political discourse. So <laughs> I, it's a, for me, it was a very enlightening book and a really interesting read, and I recommend it to anyone. It might might be a little bit dated now because it's been a few years mm -hmm. since it came out, but it's a really great book, and she is an amazing uh, scholar and in, individual. Well, thank you. So the one of the purposes of Women at Iowa is to assist future historians interested in the lives of women on the mm -hmm. University of Iowa campus. What message would you like to send to the future about the historical <laughs> changes that we see today? To the future. Wow, that's a good question. Um, I, 
what I would like to see us think about, and, and this maybe comes from my experience from the Equal Rights Amendment, where we see a lot of criticism of like second wave feminists, and I sort of consider myself, you know, in the gap between the second and third wave almost, mm -hmm. even though I was I was there uh, for the ERA campaign, which is what the second wave is really strongly identified with. But what, what I see us doing is spending a lot of time criticizing what our foremothers didn't do right and not recognizing what they did do mm -hmm. and then taking it from there. So we spend a lot of time, you know, attacking ourselves instead of being like, I know I've used this word several times, instead of being proactive and, and saying, you know, these folks accomplished all of this stuff given what they had to work with. Now where do we take it? And so I'd, I'd like to see us focus less on the negative and why we screwed things up if we did, why we lost issues, why, you know, and, and more on where did we get, where did we come from, how far have we gotten, and what's the next step? Mm -hmm. Well, on that hopeful note, thank you so much for sure. being here with us today. Oh, thanks for asking me. And thank you for joining us for another episode of Women at Iowa. We will never give